So today we're going to repair this Tektronix TDS3052 uh, 2-channel 500 megahertz 5 giga samples per second uh, digital oscilloscope. I bought this uh, scope at auction. It was about three hundred pounds, so maybe three fifty dollars, so maybe four hundred dollars. Um, I bought this, and I thought it might be functional. Uh, if you have a look at it, there was a service sticker on the top, two thousand nineteen. Uh, it's only two thousand and twenty-one, so I, I, I thought, okay, it probably is okay. But um, what I have to say is, whenever I've seen these stickers on on items, they usually mean that they're broken, right? So. Um, I should have seen that as a red flag. Um, one thing that was particularly nice though was this calibration integrity seal was intact. Um, it's not intact anymore because I've taken a look inside and I have a rough idea of what I need to repair this and I've gone and bought that. But um, but yeah, this meant that this was a complete unit even if it was broken and that, that gives me a bit more hope that I'll be able to repair it because finding parts and all parts is, is challenging. Um, this scope has been torn down by the EEV blog, and so I'll link to that down below. Um, and they talked a little bit about how to get into here. They gave the clues, but they didn't really tell you because this has got one of the weirdest uh, opening systems I've ever seen. So you have the single screw here that you have to remove. So you just remove that quickly. And once that screw's out, what you then have to do is you have to go to the side of the case where there's the handle, and you have to grab another screwdriver and lever out this uh, cover and then the thing that you have to do is come on yeah there we are you don't attack this screw what you have to do is pull out with a pair of pliers this pin that's in here right that's locating the that, that's holding the preventing this from rotating and then then you can rotate this to the point where you can extract this whole uh, this whole handle <laughs> Okay, so what I did was I got a pliers into those two locations there, and then I could rotate it, and then while rotating it, I pulled the handle out, and you see this comes out. So this whole section here um, will come out. You can see it's got these two locating pins, and that the case itself actually has this uh, there. So what you're gonna have to do is rotate this to a sort of vertical orientation before you can actually get that out. And you have to do that on the other side as well. What I'm going to do is remove a couple of things first. So if you open up this, this is a battery compartment. If you don't have a battery, they give you a little cool tray for your probe. I'm going to use that to store the pins from the hinge mechanism and the screw from the back. So that will make a great teardown tray. Um, once that's empty, I'm also going to remove this communications module here. So I have to just depress this. You can see I've already taken it out. I have to back in quickly to show you how to tear it down. And then we're good to remove this entire back panel. So I think this should just come off, if I'm mistaken. So, and we're in. So looking at this, this oscilloscope, um, we need to kind of uh, figure out what's wrong with it, right? So uh, what I did was, uh, what is the problem with it? Um, turning it on, it, it did nothing, right? It didn't, it wouldn't, it wouldn't switch on, you didn't get a buzz or a click or anything in there. So I suspect it's a power supply issue. Um, I actually have got a power analyzer that um, I used and it was really drawing no current whatsoever. Um, well, actually, do you know what? We'll, we'll check, we'll check. So let's put power in. And be really careful because this is now a little bit hairy. And the power analyzer is telling me that it's drawing 40 milliamps. Okay, so it is drawing something. Um, but it's not trying to start up, you know, the, this this thing needs maybe a half an amp or more to, to kind of start up. So it seems to be drawing a little bit, but but not much. So I suspect that the, the um, power supply is, is a problem. Um, I've got to be really super careful though, because the power supply is located right underneath this tray here, which I'm going to take out, the options tray. And yeah, there's the switch mode power supply. So what you can see is the, the mains comes in here on the left. We get the um, main side of the switching power supply. I've got the flyback transformer here, and then I've got my secondary side. Now, one of the things I did when I opened up the case before was I actually just checked to see if this 
if this power supply was working. So I looked at the data sheet, and if you look at the data sheet for these power supplies, the NAN407615, you know that they actually have just one output, and it's just um, 15 volts. And that the output connector from the data sheet tells you that there's, you know, the top three connectors are positive, the bottom three connectors are negative. So I removed this and decided to try and power it up. Um, so I, I checked, first of all, was the power supply giving any voltage out on here, and it was giving nothing at all. So then I decided to try and apply some power. So just getting a couple of bits of wire, popping them in the connector like that, setting my, uh, my voltage to 15 volts, and then I basically uh, parallel, parallel these two outputs because um, this supply is rated to something like 2 to 3 amps, but my uh, supply can only do about 1 amp on each channel. Um, then if I turn this on, Ah, okay, I probably haven't switched the scope on up front. So let's have a look. Okay, funnily enough, when the case is removed, you can't actually press this button, so I had to just hold the other side of it. So yeah, turning that on, all of a sudden, the scope comes back to life. Brilliant. So we know it's the um, the switching power supply. Um, we can see the power on self-check passed. Brilliant, okay, so we've got a full set of passes there. So we know that the scope's good. All we need to do is somehow get 15 volts into the switch mode power supply. We'll just have a quick look at the rest of the board though. Um, so we've got a switch mode power supply there, this NAN40. Then we have this vertical board right next to it and it has some more inductors on here uh, and capacitors. Um, then we have a battery connector down here in the mains power, right? So clearly what's happening here is the 15 volts are coming off this power supply and they're being filtered here and they could be, um, they looks like they generate a whole load of other voltages that come off onto this connector here. And that connector goes down through onto the main board down at the back here. And then again, there's another uh, inductor. Now, there's two ways I could go about this. I could either buy a new power supply, um, something rated to just put out 15 volts and jam this in this case because these supplies aren't available anymore. Um, but I, I don't really want to do that because it's likely that the Tektronics engineers have designed this power board here to filter out very carefully the switching frequency of this of this um, power supply. So um, I, what I would ideally like to do is repair this switch mode power supply. So that's what I'm going to try and do. Um, there's, now, how do I do that? I'm going to have to probably extract this from this case. I'm going to have to be really careful because... Um, you know, you can see the usual topology of a, of a flyback um, a switch mode power supply. I have the mains coming, fuse, filtering choke to prevent the switching noise going back out from this uh, power supply onto the mains. Um, you can see a set of four diodes there. That's probably the full bridge rectifier. So this is going to be rectifying 230 AC volts uh, onto this capacitor here, which is probably 300 odd volts. So I'm going to have to be really careful that that's discharged and, and also just never believe that it's discharged at any point, otherwise this power supply could give me a real tickle. Um, so I'm going to pull this out and then uh, try and figure out what's gone. It could be a few things, you know. Um, there's the switching transistor, so that's actually going to be a prime candidate for a failure. Um, then there could, have, could be the rectifying diode perhaps on the output there as well. Uh, so what I'm going to do is just go through I'll probably check that the switching regulator is getting all the signals it needs. And you know what? I can't see it. I'm guessing that this thing down here, I mean, that could be the switching regulator. I have to look up its part number. Um, but let's just turn off the, support, no, the scope. But there's only one IC that I can see right now. And I wonder if that's the feedback IC, right? It's in, it's in about the right place for... We're passing back the feedback. But you can see this is a remarkably simple switch mode power supply. I mean, there's very few components here. And one of the things I noticed is this NAN40 series has many different variants. So it has variants that have triple output, single output, many different voltages. So a lot of what you see actually on this, this um, isolated side of the supply, away from the mains, um, there's a ton of missing components. Um, and it looks like we've got one of the, the simpler simpler spins of this. But I really can only see two three pin packages there and this guy. So this this might be the switching controller. So I reckon that's a um, prime candidate for re replacement.
So what I'm going to do is get this out, and I'm probably going to feed a DC voltage in here instead of an AC one. That'll still get through the bridge rectifier. It just won't rectify it. It'll all be rectified. Um, and then it, I'm going to uh, see if I can get this switching at some very low voltage, like 30 volts, 40 volts, so it's safe to work on. Uh, and then I'm going to um, try and debug uh, where the actual switch mode controller is and see if it's getting all the signals I expect. So the first thing I'm going to do is actually verify that the main capacitor is discharged. So if I just pop these two probes and put them across this main capacitor here, you can see we're still at uh, 276 volts, <laughs> which is uh, sort of terrifying. So the first thing I need to do is, is uh, discharge that. So. There we are. So I put my um, meter into low impedance mode. Um, I'm not sure if that's probably the best way of doing this. Uh, I should check what the actual, you know, supported current and and so on as that. But I imagine that's okay. And then if I check this capacitor again, you can see we're at a safe 11 volts. But one of the things to watch out for is capacitors um, have memory. So you can see this one is charging back up again. So um, if you want to be extra safe, you actually should um, should solder some piece of wire across there. But as we're going to try and boot this up in a minute, there's no, no point in trying to do that just yet. But it would be nice to have, for safety, some way of shorting those terminals while I'm not doing things. Maybe a magnet. Do you think that would work? So next what we need to do is remove this out. So I'm going to pull this, um, pull this mains connector here. Um, I'm going to just pull this out of the way and by the look of it I just need to undo these four screws in the corners if I remove these two screws here and this one here then I'll actually uh, be able to access this from, from PCB so let's do that Oh yeah, so one of the things I was thinking of doing was actually just powering it from the outside using this DC jack at the back. But if you look at the case, the case actually says it's 15 volts DC out. So um, I'm, you know, kind of surprising. That's It's not an area to feed 15 volts in and test if the scope would work with its uh, you know switch mode power supply. Um, okay, so I removed the two screws that held this in. Now what I'm going to do is try and remove this connector here. Um, just using a screwdriver to kind of lever back the locking part of it. And that might be enough to get this out, but it's a really long locking part, so it's being a little bit challenging. All right, there we are. And we're nearly free. One last connector just down here. That looks interesting. Yeah, look at that. So this... This wire goes into the shrink wrap for the mains and then doesn't actually go anywhere. So this looks like it's actually measuring the mains frequency. This might be a little loop to measure the mains frequency. Um, yeah, that's kind of cute. Uh, right, and we can see there is actually a switching, some kind of switching topology here on this, this battery board, which you'd expect, right, to, to boost the battery up. As needed. Oh, we've got a little uh, press button switch here on the back. That must be a reset pin, yeah? Oh, it's a cowl button. Okay, that's the cowl button. Just there, that's the cowl button. Um, here we've got the battery connector, switch mode power supply. Okay, so let's see if we can get rid of these last two screws. Oh, well, look at that. Oh, that's annoying. So I removed that screw, but if you have a look, the way that this thing goes in is that top line here is actually just socketed in. Look at that. If you just pull it out, that whole back stripe there, or well, that should save somebody some work. You don't need to remove those top two screws, just the ones that are accessible. And yeah, so I can leave that in, um, pull that out uh, instead of you know, removing the connectors and making it difficult to get to. I wondered how they got that in. Okay, so we've got a nice look at the scope here. Oh, that's kind of nice. 
So we can see the um, uh, high voltage uh, power supply for the cold cathode on the back of the display. We can see our timekeeping RAM. Okay, so there's our clock. Um, these will be the input channels in the shielded connector here. And here you've got your, your filtering of your, um, of your input voltage. So yes, yeah, there. And that's going to be our CD connector there. Uh, a couple of linear regulators in there as well. I'm guessing. And there you are. There you have it. That's everything. And this connector down here probably goes to the front panel uh, BNCs um, because we have, yeah, we have um, smart probe uh, detem uh, detection. Right, so we're pretty sure all that's working fine. What we're going to do, put that over there for now. Um, we're also pretty sure that this battery management system is working. I don't have a battery to test, but it seems to be just fine. So no problems there. Oh yeah, sorry, this is this is one of the things I was gonna say, interesting choice. The ground goes straight to this frame here, and that's how it then couples into the switch mode power supply um, through these kind of sections here. And I just thought it was interesting. I, I, I would have perhaps explicitly wired it, you know? There is space on the switch mode power supply for a ground pin. I would have expected it to be explicitly wired to here, as well as to the chassis as well, just to Make sure that that connection was never broken. Okay, so let's get this set up uh, under the microscope and start looking at parts. The situation's getting pretty desperate. I'm already uh, working up a circuit diagram for this um, on Falstad. So I've already got the input uh, filtering and rectification and the main capacitor on here. And so far that all looks good so um i then decided to i don't know take a chance and see if it would be the uh, the mosfet that's going to be driving this flyback transformer and um, so i desolder it using uh, this vacuum desoldering station that i have and this iron this t12 iron that i had and that allowed me to remove the uh the fat this fat from the board and uh, yeah, it's an IRF 830. That's kind of not surprising that we have a fat. So I'm gonna use my little uh, transistor tester, just kind of set it down here. And sure enough, any MOS and then propagate source. And if we have a look at the data sheet for the system, that looks, I don't know, looks right to me. So I think we're getting pretty close to success here in finding what's wrong with this. So um, I thought it might be the switching transistor, this MOSFET here that's driving this flyback transformer, but that tested out fine. So I checked the actual windings of this and it seems okay. It seems like the windings are connected top to bottom. There's up, up to four windings that could be connected here, but I don't think there's that many actually in use in this single, single supply unit. And the, but, so the windings were fine. Um, and then I started to kind of get tackle into this. So basically you have your mains input, your fuse, and then this is some filtering here and a choke here to actually um, just stop any switching noise moving back down into the mains. And then we get across, we get um, into this rectifying section here. This is another filter cap across this rectifying section and then that charges this capacitor and then after that we move around to the top of the circuit and then here we kind of two things happen either we go into the actual kind of switching circuit and uh you know that that's the main current path and you can identify it on the back here because it's this this trace that's been thickened with additional solder um and that's where the switching transistor is okay that um or, right, you've got to go, usually there's some kind of um, start-up circuit. So I think down here we have, I mean, there's, this is all discrete, right? So um, the, the, there's a few key things that I've identified. There's a voltage reference here. This is the optocoupler that links the isolated side to the, to the main side. Um, so this is doing the voltage comparison and basically saying whether to turn this thing on. And I think these two transistors here are probably arranged in some kind of latch, right? So so once the mains voltage comes up high enough, then 
these will latch on and the system starts oscillating uh, somehow, right? I, I don't know how. But how that, that, start, that system starts up, I think, is through these two little brown resistors here. Um, so if you have a look, they are the brown resistor starts up here and then jumps across down to just above this hole where I've desoldered the, the heat sink for the switching transistor. And there is a little path just behind it. And that snakes down all the way into here and into this, this, this region here. Plus there's that kind of uh, resistor across there. So, yeah, what I was doing was I was just buzzing out the circuit, trying to actually kind of create a diagram for this piece here, and then I was going to kind of figure out the os what, how this oscillator was starting up and so on. But I noticed that I couldn't read the resistance of this upper brown resistor. So let's try and buzz that now. So my meter's working. Uh, just check. Yep, we're getting a short there on this. Um, and if I try and measure these two points, so this first part of the resistor, and this side, oh, it's measuring now. Well, is it? Is that because I'm hitting that capacitor? Now you see, it measured for a second there, but I wonder if I was charging something. I think I'm going to have to take this out of circuit to check it, but I was getting nothing there before. And even if it was charging, if there was some kind of capacitance in there that I was charging up, you with the you know the resistance tester, you'd still imagine to reach a steady state which would have some measurable resistance here, rather than kind of overload. And um, if I come around to the other side, what makes me really believe that is if I come around to the other side and check the other side of the resistor, then we pretty quickly get 392 kilo ohm. And that's what I'd expect, right? But around the other side, yeah, look at that. I get a weird kind of oscillation, which I think is just some capacitance in there. And then I get overload out of range. So I'm going to pull this, this uh, resistor out, uh, check it out of circuit, and then we'll see. So I'm going to try and desolder this and lift it out of circuit and just see if I can see any damage on it. I couldn't see anything under the microscope. Um, but I, one of the things I just wanted to say is that this is the first time I've really used my desoldering gun in anger. And it's a, it's a cheap desoldering gun, yeah, it's uh, about £100. Pounds. Um, but it made such short work of this ginormous heat sink and uh, MOSFET removal that I, I just can't believe I didn't have one earlier. The, the best £100 I've spent in soldering equipment uh, ever. So right, so what I'm going to do is just desolder this one. All I have to do is get the end of the, the desoldering gun over, kind of position it on the pad, wobble it around a bit to make sure everything's melting, and then turn it on. And that's desoldered. Unbelievable. <laughs> How easy is that? I will, I'm going to take out both ends because I think I can replace this with just a single resistor. Especially if one of them's failed, maybe the other one will too. That is a broken pad. Huh. Open. Unbelievable. That side's open. Unbelievable. Got a failed resistor. I just didn't even I just didn't even suspect it. Why that resistor would fail. Plus it's not like it you know it's not like it's gonna Well, okay, let's think about this. It's meant to be a four hundred K resistor or three hundred and ninety K resistor if it's it's got the same markings as that one. Um three hundred and ninety K and three hundred volts. I mean it's DC, it's not AC. Why would that fail? This thing's going to see no, almost no action. So what I'm going to do is, that's a pretty dumb failure, you know. Um, that will easily take down this thing if it doesn't start. 
then uh, that'll that'll do it really. I'm I'm not going to really suspect anything else in the circuit because I mean this shouldn't have failed. The the you know 390k, 300 odd of volts. That means we're you know looking at maybe one milliamp of current passing through this thing. <laughs> um, I have no idea why this would why this would fail under that load. So we're going to replace this with a quarter of watt resistor rated at 800 kilo ohms or the nearest kind of standard resistance to that and I'm going to put the um, switching uh, MOSFET back in and I'm going to hope that's it we're going to try starting this up under the power supply again another tech tip um, storing components envelopes is a brilliant way of doing it so you can quickly you know get through your resistance um, values and see what you have okay so we're not trying to get up to a mega ohm looking for about what's it they were 390 uh, kilo ohm resistors so we're probably looking at 780 uh, which we can't make here so we could look for a 390 and pair them up do you know what i do not have 390 ohm 390 kilo ohm resistors so the nearest thing i have 680 or one mega ohm uh, alternatively i could parallel two resistors to get closer so i'll just check my parts inventory see if i've got something else so if i take a 3.3 mega ohm and a one mega ohm resistor then that will actually come out to about 77 kilo ohm oof I don't want to take the 3 watt resistors there no point in overdoing it so if I just take those two so that's a 3.3 and a 1 mega ohm resistor 0.76 that'll do right that'll do let's get that in there if you have a look this one here i lifted the pad off um during desoldering that was my fault um i've put a blob of solder here on the actual line just to um just to prevent it being pulled through again uh so that's just a dirty great big blob of solder to kind of hold it there um but what i'm going to try and do is is just to kind of remove some of the solder mask and try and connect to it so i'm just going to etch that away you know what, this is going better than I thought it would. I was worried I'd cut the trace, but to be honest, I'm fairly convinced that that trace is, is fine. Then what we'll do is we'll just poke this over. So I definitely have a pad there now, something I can solder to. So I'll just pop this over. Try and get it flat and see if that makes a convincing. Oh, sorry. See if that will make a convincing joint. What do you think? That looks really hokey. That looks really hokey. Let's see if we can get a side side view. I don't know. I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to trim this here and then I'm going to put a copper trace in. A bit of magnet wire to make sure the job's done. So now what I'm going to do is just use my power sub, my bench power supply to put about 30, 40, maybe up to 60 volts through here and then we're going to see if this thing switches on and gives us, uh, gives us uh, an output. So, first of all, at 30 volts, we're not really seeing anything out. So, let's just try. I'm not seeing any current here. So, I'm imagining that that's probably due to this not getting up to the a sufficient voltage to turn it on. Oh, I heard switching noise. 40 milliamps are going through there. Do you know what? I think we've fixed it. 
Any smoke? Nope. Still got 40 milliamps. Oh, this is exciting. What do we think? Positive at the top. Oh, look at that. 15 volts. Rock solid. Oh, that's a good fix. So let's get it back in the scoop and put it all back together. Um, but everything's back together, so we'll just see if it turns on. Nothing. Oh, you need to put a power cable in. Use a failure. Oh, yes, look at that. That's a successful repair. I'll let it do its diags and then we'll check. But in the meantime, what I'm going to do is talk to you about the next part of this, which is the upgrade. So, um, oh, self check, pass, brilliant. So let's hit utility, go to system config, um, diags, and then OK to remove, run all of them. So while that's running, we're going to talk about upgrading this. So these these um, scopes are uh, have options, and um, in order to enable the options, what you have to do is insert a module up here. Now there's these blanking uh, blanking ones just in there at the moment, and what they cover up is surprisingly SIM-like. It looks like the contact pads of a SIM card. Just to check. Yes, look at that. Brilliant. Now, um, what what goes in here? You might you might be forgiven for thinking that what goes in here is some kind of you know um, complex uh, kind of program or software that that's, that ends for on the scope. Um, but that's not the case. And so what I did was I actually bought one of the options. And the one that I've bought here is the TDS3 trigger, so it's advanced triggering, okay? And you can see it's got kind of a little SIM contact on the back. And if I pop this in, I think I'll probably have to restart the scope. Let's see if we can figure out how to do this. System diags. Oh, application piece power cycle. Great. So that's in. You can see now we've now got the advanced trigger in there. And let's see if it actually gives me anything. Advanced trigger, right? So we now have advanced trigger, but this is um, version 1.17 of the firmware. Now, what I believe has happened, um, it, it might seem like a stupid idea to buy the advanced trigger because the latest firmware for this scope actually gives you the advanced trigger capability for free. They were trying to make the scope more competitive against other options at the time, which had it. However, I, I bought this for a good reason. I bought this because inside this is an EEPROM. And if I just pop this out, so I bought this one cheaply because, you know, it's a useless kind of advanced option now, given that the firmware already um, supports this. But if we just pop this case open, and you, you will have to break this, what well, you notice inside these units, it's very little indeed. It's just this contact board and a little X24CO2049, uh, and I believe that's just an EEPROM. I don't even think it's a particularly big EEPROM. So um, having read some uh, posts on the EEV blog forum and actually noticing that people have designed their own PCBs for exactly this EEPROM, um, it turns out you can flash certain strings to this that'll actually unlock all options on the scope. Um, and so that's what I'm gonna try and do and we'll test it out. Let's first of all upgrade the firmware on this and then see where we get to with programming this. So to get the firmware graded on this TDS, um, you actually have to uh, use four floppy disks to actually reprogram the scope. Now the only computer I have that actually even has a floppy disk anymore is this laptop that I rescued from the trash. And I rescued it because it's kind of just it, well, it's perfect really. So not only does it have a floppy disk, it also has, you know, an old dial-up modem, SVDA out for, for interfacing with your TV. Um, there's Ethernet, PS2 mouse, it has infrared, hardware serial, um, a, a, a parallel port as well. Actually, is that dual serial? Sorry, that's display and uh, serial. Uh, and USB, would you believe it has USB? So I'm actually trying 
right now to see if um, I can just bring the files over here. Um, but listen to that poor thing. It's struggling. Uh, it's been <laughs> finding this new hardware for the last, I don't know, five minutes. Wow, look at that. USB mass storage device. Eventually, once it's figured out how to read this uh, mythical USB disk, I'll be able to just fo format four disks and reprogram the scope. See you in about an hour or so. All done. No safely removing hardware here. Let's see if the drive's broken in this thing. So I'm not sure exactly what the procedure is. Oh, uh, here we go. This procedure will replace the instrument five minutes. Press OK to load new firmware. Oh. One hour later. So this actually took more than an hour. I ended up bricking the scope um, and and doing a load of like back and forth, writing new disks, floppy disks, and so on. And essentially, what happened was, in the end, it turned out that the floppy disk on the scope was was unreliable. And so, when I try switched to the second disk of this install, um, it failed to read it. And no matter what I, I did, you know, rewriting the disk and so on, it just wouldn't read that disk. Uh, so I had to, in the end, turn the scope off and turn it back on. It turned out the scope was bricked. Um, it it could still it would still uh, go into a recovery mode to load the firmware, but it wouldn't read any of the firmware disks, not even disk one anymore. So um, I, I verified that the disks were okay and the data was being created correctly. So I knew it was the scope. I ended up opening the floppy drive and finding that it was full of dust. I cleaned the dust out, cleaned the heads, and then when I booted the scope up, it took the disks and it actually restarted once out of its own accord, and then actually booted up and. I, it, it was working. Unfortunately, I didn't get any of the footage of it working in the end because uh, my, my phone ran out of space. So I'm just going to skip straight to um, adding the extra options now. So to actually unlock this, um, this, pro this into a module that will do everything, we've got to actually reprogram the, uh, the chip that's on there. Um, so what I'm doing is I'm using two tools that I haven't used before, but I'm really, really excited about using. One is this PC Byte, PCB Byte, but a uh, you know PC Byte, I guess is how they should say it, which um, is a little kind of magnetic stand that you can actually clamp uh, PCBs in like this using these kind of posts. Uh, so I've just clamped the PCB at either end with that guy. But the real kind of nice thing about the system are these kind of flexible probes you've got pogo pins and you can just drop them straight onto an IC and what I've done is I've only got four um, four kind of logic level ones I have two oscilloscope probes but they're not going to work for what I want to do because they've got a termination on them right so they've got a 10 to 1 divider uh, at the end in the region of mega ohms to you know give you a transmission line give you signal integrity but that's not going to be any good for programming I just need a direct cable connection so I'm using the four probes that I have um, and what I've done is I've looked on the data sheet for this device so if you look at this X24CO2 um, uh, it has a series of pins but there's address pins one to three are address pins I'm assuming that this little kind of adapter that I have here already sorts those address pins um, out because they should be basically tied to ground or, or high depending on what I squared C address you want this um, EEPROM to be on and uh, and yeah I'm assuming it's at some kind of sensible default um, then what I've done is I've actually wired up VSS to ground VCC and then the right control SCL and the SDA pins so I um, I wired them up without really knowing what they were just by putting them onto the right locations in my um, ZIF socket zero insertion force socket on my programmer now the problem is I need to put five pins in so the fifth pin is done just by me sitting here and holding it holding it in like that um, to check that I did everything right the first thing I'm going to do, uh, do is use the the programming tool for the TL uh, 866 um, plus um, 
yeah, by the way, it's a Windows software, but you can get it working under Wine. There's some some great projects that just have a little tiny DLL that you have to copy over, and it works on Linux, and, and it works absolutely fine. So I put the device in, held the cable there. It didn't work. I kind of moved some of the pins around to make sure that they had good connections, and then sure enough, I could read the, the chip. So I'm now pretty happy that I can uh, get communications to this uh, I2C while it's still in this. Um, now, let's have a look at the hacks. So if you have a look at the hacks, you can see that this, um, the, these hex codes here are just kind of an offset and then actually a you know, statement of what the thing is plus a copyright statement down here. Um, I, think, I think we can probably just change this top line here and unlock, um, unlock other features. Now, there's a big discussion thread about this on the EV Big Blog Forum. Um, and they say that all you have to do is change that to E N G, and that gives you the engineering one. There is another one, I think UAM or something like that, will unlock all of the modules. But E N G is their internal engineering code, and that enables all modules plus beta features. And what's quite nice about this is I have the original three hundred five two, but the three hundred five two B and C models that are out there have, I think. A feature called wave alert which is not enabled on these scopes but if you use the end version it is so um while it kind of perhaps exposes more than you want uh, to really look at um tds3 eng is probably the the more interesting of the um options uh, if you've got a 3052 uh, instead of a b or a c version right so uh, that's the firmware that's the firmware changed um now i'm just going to hit program and pop this Pop this pin back on. Okay, that's it programmed. So I just push the module back in. It's a bit loose, but it'll be held together by the, uh, the pressure of the scope anyway. And then for fun, I use my label printer to just uh, print an omega sign. It's a bit crappier than I, look, I wanted it to look. But uh, yeah, that's, that's kind of a, I don't know, funny. It's the final module you'll need for this, uh, for this scope. So we'll do the moment of truth. I'll put a blanking one in. And we'll put the empty, now empty, uh, trigger one at the back just for storage. But it's, you know, empty. Now, moment of truth, what do we have? Oh, look at that. Advanced analysis, beta enabled, all of the things enabled. Okay, so yeah, trigger was already there. I think there was something like basic video, but now we have extended video, um, advanced analysis. So that's um, analyzing analyzing the waveform. You got limit tests. That's interesting. If I was going to use this in production, six hundred one um, in production testing, um, six hundred one digital video that allows you to kind of sync on certain video frames, um, and beta enabled. I think gives me this waveform. Wave, uh, wave alert. So let's just have a look. The app section here. Oh yeah, look at all these apps. Yeah, look at all these things. So masks. Okay, I've got mask control. Um, ITUT. Whatever the transmission standard that is. Yeah, okay. I wonder if I can. Ah, okay. So there's my three modules. So I've got telecom. ITU R601 and limit tests. Ah, here we are. So in my acquire menu, there's a wave alert. Anomaly detection. Okay, I'm going to have to look at that one. But supposedly that's, that's uh, new. So that's the end of the um, repair, teardown repair, and upgrade of this TDS3052. Pretty happy with that one. Have we seen that in, the in future videos?